Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Uh, thanks to everyone for coming to this CSIS event on facial recognition technology. My name is Jim Lewis. Uh, I'm going to moderate a panel later on. We wanted to do this because uh, facial recognition is not CSI. Uh, a lot of times you hear the dangers and the risks. There's uh, some, some room for questioning there, some room for error. So we thought today we'd talk about some of the positive uses, some of the things you can do with uh, CS with facial recognition um, that will make things easier for people in the future. And what I've found, uh, the speakers may have the similar experiences. When you tell people, you know, this is what it will do, uh, most are enthusiastic. So we have a great panel today with two experts, Jody Harden and Jake Parker. Uh, to introduce them, I'm going to turn to my friend for a long time, John Boyd. John, over to you. Thank you, Jim, uh, very much. Uh, my name is John Boyd. I'm the Assistant Director of the Office of Biometric Identity Management within our U.S. Department of Homeland Security. First, I'd like to thank CSIS and fellow participants for this important event, as forums like this ultimately aid the development of more effective facial recognition technologies and practices. As a society, we need to inform the best approaches to data collection, retention, matching, and sharing through a range of perspectives spanning government, industry, academia, law, and civil society. Next, the disclaimer. My statements should not necessarily be considered official or to reflect the position of DHS. And with that, let's get started. Demand for facial recognition technologies, or FRT, is accelerating, as highlighted by several, several valuable reports recently published by CSIS. FRT provides convenience and security, but there are reasonable concerns that if it is deployed too quickly and without controls protecting the data, it could erode privacy. Although legi legitimate, these concerns are sometimes exacerbated by confusion over how facial recognition technology actually works. Oftentimes, politicization and oversimplification create an exaggerated sense of risk leading several jurisdictions in the United States to create their own rules and regulations regarding FRT, its use and its appropriate applications. In the absence of federal laws, this trend will likely continue leading to regulatory fragmentation and uncertainty, thus slowing innovation. As we attempt to demystify this technology, it will be important to confront FRT's risks, assess its challenges and emphasize its many net positive applications in support of a diverse set of missions across the US government and with our industry partners. Whether for security or convenience, FRT provides us an opportunity to take the guesswork out of authenticating a person's identity. Before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to level the playing field a bit by providing a basic understanding of the way we at DHS use FRT. Face recognition is the comparison of two or more face photos to determine if they are of the same person. DHS uses face, facial recognition to support national security and public safety through detecting and identifying fraud and supporting cross-border criminal investigations and enhancing the delivery of benefits and services like expediting verification of travelers' identities. Some examples include verifying traveler identities at ports of entry, identifying victims of child exploitation or human trafficking, Identifying individuals engaged in cross-border criminal activity, such as the online and sexual exploitation of children or financial or benefits fraud. At DHS, the, the facial recognition process occurs in two fundamental ways. First, through an automated process involving a face matching algorithm. The National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST, tested the face matching algorithms currently used by DHS and determined, determined it to be one of the top performers. Second, through trained human face examiners who can, for example, review lists of candidate images resulting from automated searches of one face image against many to identify an unknown person 
or compare an in-person individual to the photo on their presented document, like a passport. DHS is required by law and policy to embed privacy protections and transparency into all of its activities. Any DHS activity which collects personally identifiable information or impacts privacy is subject to oversight by the chief privacy officer and falls within the scope of federal data privacy and disclosure laws. DHS continues to engage in objective, independent assessments of facial recognition performance and works to advance facial recognition standards. We're working with NIST to develop a face image quality standard that will lead to even greater accuracy in face recognition systems. In addition, DHS s and enhances industry innovation and advances technologies that support DHS operations through collaborations with NIST, the National Science Foundation, DHS Centers of Excellence and Industry. s and holds industry challenges like biometric technology rallies that bring together subject matter experts, technology vendors and volunteers to test emerging biometric systems including assessing face recognition devices and algorithms and encouraging the development of stronger and more accurate systems. DHS continues to leverage partners outside the US government to assist with data accuracy and the proper implementation of capabilities. This work includes funding the National Academies of Sciences to perform an in-depth study of facial recognition technology to improve accuracy and thus biometric equity. And based on our work at, in DHS, I submit three challenges. First, we encourage policymakers to address significant cha changes to FRT and the policies that guide them. To date, public perception and fear of surveillance, as well as the improper use of these technologies, is impeding the responsible adoption of capabilities that can counter national security threats, reunify families, and confront fraud while providing benefits to citizens and immigrants alike. Next, we call upon Congress to consider a public education campaign that accompanies existing and future legislation on biometrics. Recognition and verification are different than characterization. The US government is committed to the legal frameworks that ensure a person's identity remains their own, safeguarding civil rights, civil liberties, and rights to privacy, while providing faster, more efficient, and effective ways to verify a person's identity and improve their quality of life. Lastly, I think it's important to emphasize the need for access to high quality, high confidence identity data for testing purposes. A system is only as good as the information ingested. Big power competition makes this even more pressing as we compete with countries who refrain from adhering to the same ethical standards as the United States when it comes to collecting, storing, and employing identity information. With that, it's time to turn the mic over to our trusted leaders in this field, Acting Deputy Executive Assistant Commissioner for Field Operations at U.S. Customs and Border Protection, Ms. Jody Harden, and Senior Director of Government Relations at the Security Industry Association, Mr. Jake Parker. Ms. Harden was asked to serve in this role as she has a deep understanding of CBP's innovation initiatives as she leads strategic transformation as senior, senior Director of Government Relations for the Security Industry Association, Mr. Jake Parker leads the development of the association's legislative and regulatory programs. He comes to SIA with more than 12 years of experience on Capitol Hill, most recently as Legislative Director for U.S. Representative Tom Latham, a senior member of the House Appropriations Committee. Jake Hill's, uh, Jake's Hill experience his knowledge of the legislative process and his familiarity with industry partners rounds out this discussion, covering multiple bases, all highly relevant to the FRT discussion. With that, I'll turn it back to you, Jim. Thank you. I am looking forward to this discussion. Thank you, John, for those great introductions. Uh, what we'll do is we'll have Jody speak first for about 15 minutes, followed by Jake for the same period of time, and then we'll go into a, a moderated discussion with the two of them of the points they've raised and any issues. Um, if we have time at the end, we'll see if there's a way to get questions from the audience. Uh, it's a little tight, but hopefully we can squeeze a few in. Um, with that, 
let me turn it over to Jody, please. Good afternoon. Um, I do appreciate CSIS um, for giving me this opportunity to be able to speak with you today about Customs and Border Protection's use of facial comparison technology. I'd like to start with a little bit of background as our agency does have some unique authorities and operations that lend to the success of our use of facial comparison technology. We do have a congressional mandate to biographically capture information on all travelers crossing our borders that's been in effect since 1996. After the events of 9-11, we were further mandated to biometrically confirm non-US citizen travelers as well as to leverage technology to authenticate all travel and entry documents that are presented to us at ports of entry. In 2004, we began to collect fingerprints and photographs for non-citizens between the ages of 14 and 79, with a few exceptions. This ability to collect biometric information on exit proved to be a little bit more of a challenge due to our lack of infrastructure and um, we do have a dual mission to expedite lawful travel while securing the borders, which um, you know, turned out to be a little bit more of a problem because we were adding processes as we look to test different types of technologies. Um, we did test iris, we tested taking fingerprints, and what we were finding is that we couldn't add additional processes without significantly impacting the operations. We realized that we needed to partner with our stakeholders to create a process that uses expected passenger behaviors and found that facial comparison was the best fit. We also recognize that we already receive information from international carriers through advanced manifest data on all of the passengers that are expected to enter and leave the US daily. So when we reviewed those manifests against our vast data holdings of travel documents, previous encounters that had been recorded since 2004, we realized that we already had photos of most of the travelers that we encounter. We were able to develop the traveler verification system um, service, excuse me, which is a cloud-based matching service that is the backbone of our biometrics program. Leveraging our advanced information, we're able to pre-populate a gallery of high quality facial images, which allows for a quick and efficient matching with much higher accuracy rates. The TVS does compare the live photo of the person um, in front of us to the source images and streamlines what was previously a manual process of comparing the person to the document that they presented to the information in our systems um, in order to get that confirmation of identity. So to meet our exit mandate, we um, partnered with the air travel industry to implement a secure standalone system that they are able to leverage to integrate into their boarding process. While the um, airlines and airports have purchased the um, facial biometric technology, which is essentially a camera for biometric exit, we provide the facial biometric matching service for them. We were also able to streamline um, utilizing this service in our own processes um, that are wholly CBP manned on entry by using TVS to reduce the need for our, for our personnel to scan travel documents or take fingerprints in order to pull up known traveler information that we already had biographically. Um, while we don't um, require US citizens to participate in our biometric process, we found that the efficiencies um, that have been affected in our operations um, have led to many of them choosing to voluntarily opt into this process um, just to be able to get process faster, essentially. Um, we do utilize um, the NEC3 algorithm, uh, which shows virtually no measurable differential performance and results based on demographic factors. We continually evaluate the performance of this algorithm and have partnered with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, as well as DHS s and to further enhance our facial comparison process. Um, there was also a study that um, NIST had published a report on earlier this year that found that our biometric exit program has match rates of 99.5% or better, which is well above the 97% um, threshold um, as per US law. Um, where we have travelers that cannot be matched by the Traveler Verification Service, um, it essentially gives back a no match um, um, feedback into the system. And then at that point, a CBP officer or airline representative just reverts back to the manual inspection of the person's passport or identity document. So it's um, got this backup of, you know, just essentially replacing, again, that identity verification that was already taking place um, in our process. We do implement a privacy by design concept and we have four primary safeguards to ensure that um, 
you know, everything is kept secure. Um, that is um, including uh, secure encryption during the data storage and transfer, irreversible biometric templates, um, brief retention periods, as well as secure storage. Um, when we do um, have US citizens that opt into our process, uh, we are uh, discarding the identity, or, or sorry, uh, photos within 12 hours of that identity verification process. And we do temporarily retain um, facial images a bit longer for non-US citizens for up to 14 days um, in secure systems to support CBP audits to evaluate the um, technology and ensure the accuracy of the matching process. Um, our business requirements in working with the carriers do not allow approved partners such as, um, again, Carol um, airlines and airport authorities or cruise lines that we work with to retain photos that they take under any of this process for their own business purposes. The travel partners have to immediately purge the images after transmittal to TVS, and we do audits on a regular basis to ensure compliance with this requirement. We also work um, closely with the um, air and um, air carriers and airport authorities to make sure that we post privacy notices. Um, we have signage that is in pro close proximity to the cameras. Um, we provide tear sheets, they do gate announcements. Um, we work with them on putting out informational videos to make sure that the traveling public is well aware of the process and, and the privacy um, um, safeguards that we have in place. Um, we also have um, more than 10 privacy impact assessments on all aspects of the CBP biometric entry exit program, which includes all of the policies and procedures for how we gather, store, analyze, use the data, um, including retention and the deletion of it. And those are um, posted on um, public website where everybody has access. So um, currently we've implemented the biometric facial comparison technology um, partially or fully at entry into um, the US at 198 airports. Um, this includes all of our preclearance locations um, and essentially every major air, airport operation that we have um, international airport operation across the United States. Um, and we are also um, utilizing this technology at exit at 32 airports. Um, in addition, we've been able to work with the passenger vessel carriers and port authorities to take this same technology and work it into um, the processes that they have um, in the cruise environment. And we have um, implemented this at multiple terminals across eight seaports. Um, we've also worked to do technology demonstrations in the pedestrian environment at land borders. It operates a little bit differently in that um, we don't have advanced information on all of the passengers coming in. Um, so what we do in the pedestrian environment is take the picture of the person and we match that to the documents that we have in our holdings doing a one-to-one -one matching to that document. And TBS is the mechanism to do that matching for us. So to date, we have processed more than 100 million travelers um, through facial biometrics across all of these environments. And we've also been able to biometrically confirm over 113 overstays on um, exit um, using uh, facial comparison technology. In addition, um, what we found again is this, you know, this algorithm and the ability to quickly match has lent to our ability to identify imposters. And since we've been using this um, since basically 2018, we've captured more than 950 imposters um, using facial comparison technology. Um, we also work uh, with our government partners and have partnered with our sister agency, the Transportation Security Administration, to pilot the use of facial matching to support screening and identity verification for pre-check passengers at the Detroit airport. Um, we're working with them currently to expand this pilot to Atlanta before the end of the um, calendar year. And just finally, I mean, uh, leveraging the successes of this program, we do plan to continue to work with our partners in industry and government to further explore how we can use facial matching to um, streamline other aspects of our operations. Great, thank you, Jody. Uh, I wanted, I'm, I'm really grateful that you did this because throughout the review we've been doing, um, CBP has been a leader and the benefits I think to travelers are, Usually when I tell people the difference between how long they have to wait in line and what they can do with facial recognition, uh, there's a lot of enthusiasm. So thank you for doing this. But now what I'd like to do is turn to another story that maybe doesn't get as much attention, and that is commercial use. 
we'll come back and have Jody and Jake talk on a, a moderated panel when Jake is done. But Jake, tell us what's going on in the commercial world. Thanks, James. And I uh, just wanted to, to start just to let you know who we are. So with Security Industry Association, we represent 1,200 member companies offering security and life safety solutions, also including the largest uh, group of companies that are developing facial recognition technology and also integrating that into other products. I want to com commend um, CISAs uh, for the growing body of work it's producing on facial recognition technology related policies including its most recent report on uh, responsible use principles in the legislative landscape. This helps foster the kind of uh, productive conversations that we need to be having uh, with policymakers and other stakeholders on the implementation of this important technology. And this includes uh, uh, last year, SIA members produced our principles for responsible and effective use of facial recognition, which reflects many of the same principles in the CSIS document. Uh, these kinds of efforts help define what responsible use of the technology looks like as well as what policies might be needed to ensure that we're uh, meeting that goal. So I was asked to uh, primarily to highlight the important commercial applications uh, and commercial interest in the technology. And first I wanted to start with, so why is there uh, commercial interest? Well, first of all, uh, th there's some advantages to biometrics technology in general. It enhances the enhanced identity security with additional credentials for multi-factor authentication. Uh, keys, cards, other kinds of credentials can easily be uh, lost, shared, or stolen, and biometric credentials cannot. It's a lot of convenience uh, for users and not having to deal with other types of credentials. It lessens also something people don't think about, but it lessens the need to, to provide other kinds of personally identifiable information, which is more vulnerable to compromise, like social security numbers, uh, date, date of birth, other kinds of ID numbers. Um, now, there's also within that, there's some advantages to facial recognition within biometrics for certain applications. One reason that, uh, as Jody mentioned, that, that uh, CBP decided upon the use of facial recognition versus others um, earlier on this, in their process. So in, in recent years, we've seen increased affordability, specialized um, and specialized and expensive extra hardware is not required. Uh, so a, a high quality camera. Uh, the, in, the accuracy is rapidly improved in the last couple of years, as uh, uh, earlier CSIS reports uh, note. Also, the speed of the match comparison uh, has greatly increased in, uh, compared to other, uh, other biometrics. And, and generally, it works more universally across different um, populations. By that, I mean uh, some, some individuals have difficulty with their fingerprints um, being picked up or not having fingerprints. Uh, also, some similar issues with iris. So, uh, and also, it's less invasive. It offers a touchless interface, which is becoming more important in today's uh, pandemic recovery. Also, uh, anti-spoofing features are now available with the technology. And then um, it can be done remotely as a photo-based technology. It does not require someone to be there in person. And that's a really important one for commercial applications. So there's, there's many commercial applications out there already that are worthwhile, but there's, it's expanding into new areas, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, and there's really a widespread customer acceptance uh, in a lot of these applications. Typically, um, you know, commercial applications, there's already user consent or an existing requirement to, to prove, to verify one's identity. And it, the applications are based on interaction with the users, which makes it easier to navigate uh, consent and other consumer rights issues. Uh, so the also, you know, it's important to point out that the commercial applications don't involve um, access, accessing massive government databases, where there's been a lot of concerns um, I'm there on the government side. So the security industry has actually been an early adopter of uh, biometric authentication in general for access control and security systems, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, because of these advantages that are offered. So I did want to mention, too, that um, so I'm talking about commercial or private sector applications, but in the public sector, um, outside of things that are inherent government function, like uh, law enforcement investigations, which is a very unique and different use of facial recognition versus other applications, but also, you know, customs in, in, um, in border protection, those are inherent government functions, but everyday applications in the public sector work just like they would in the private sector uh, for some of the applications I'm going to be talking about. So these applications can vary quite extensively by purpose and configuration. The capabilities by any um, uh, use of the facial recognition software is limited, inherently limited by the database that it is using to um, compare uh, to compare photos against. And usually uh, end users are gonna create and control that data. So not the provider of the technology, but the 
the customer, the user of the technology is going to create and control the data. And this could be whether it's an on-premise solution, uh, some kind of uh, our cloud-based solution or something in between as a hybrid. And these are designed very specifically for whatever the specific application is. Uh, some facial recognition uh, services are actually a general purpose. So it's a subscription-based um, cl uh, cloud model that you can actually upload your own image data set compare against. Um, so the performance metric that's going to be, I can tell you that one is, is better than the other, that's gonna vary also by the application. And then the configuration of how the, um, the thresholds work as far as at what point is, a, is it considered to be a match when two photos are compared or one photo is compared to many other photos. That is also gonna vary depending on the application you would want to set that higher or lower depending on what your objective is. And of course, there's also the, uh, in some applications, a very key role for human review um, of the output from the, from the software. But in other cases, particularly in identity verification, um, um, it's, it's a automated process. But the important thing to remember about all of these applications, and this is really uh, applies to many government applications as well, uh, the use of facial recognition is a way to improve a pre-existing process where verification or identifying an unknown person uh, is already occurring by other means. So this is a way to um, improve what we're, you know, improve the accuracy or the speed of a process that already exists, not create a new process. So I'll go over some of the areas where we're seeing uh, a lot of interest in the commercial sector, and I'll kind of go from what's what is um, fielded pretty robustly today, then to what is more emerging um, as far as applications. So uh, first is identity proofing. As we shift from a, to a digital um, to digital platforms away from brick and mortar. Um, you know, ways of doing retail and things like that. Um, you know, you got to have automated identity validation. So remote online identity document verification uh, can be have many different applications. Can be um, used to verify online sellers. Also for um, gig economy workers to verify their identity because uh, the, the technology works very well on selfie type images, which you'd be taking with a, you know a cell phone application. Uh, it also is highly accurate on scanned ID card photos and it can use the abilities of the device itself um, for anti-spoofing um, features. So, um, so that's one area. Another area, as we just mentioned, I'm glad we talked about the cruise ports because cruise pa passenger facilitation. So this is being used uh, uh, to, as you clear customs to come back um, if you've been on a, a cruise. And um, you know, those of us in this area, we benefit from having the Port of Baltimore very close by. Um, I, I, you know, I remember uh, being totally shocked. The last cruise I was on was in, was actually came back in Florida, but went through the process. And usually, it takes hours to get off one of these one of these ships. If you've ever done this before, and it's just it's so frustrating. But uh, was able just to walk off the ship in like ten minutes because I went through the uh, facial recognition verification at customs. But so cruise lines are actually now using this on at, on their end uh, for a lot of other uh, purposes as well. Uh, so access to your account online, access to your photos that were taken on the cruise, uh, being able to purchase items uh, without having to have your card uh, with you and to sign um, receipts and things like that. Uh, that is actually used as expanding. There's several major cruise lines that are offering um, those types of applications beyond the uh, CDP screen. Same thing with air travel. This requires um, a partnership with TSA and CBP in many cases, but uh, was mentioned earlier, the touchless curb to gate experience for travelers. Um, it obviously has huge benefits for, for, for those travelers and also uh, helps with reducing your exposure, potential exposure to COVID-19. And then in our industry, um, uh, access control, uh, electronic access control systems is a huge area. Uh, this, this, you can use your facial recognition match for um, unlocking your mobile device, but also unlocking a door uh, to your office or to your uh, to your building, but also to authenticate your access to a computer network. So we've had here in our offices in, in Maryland uh, for the last five years, we've had facial recognition and to be able to enter the office. Another, um, uh, another sector of the industry that's, that's really um, uh, using facial recognition heavily is the gaming industry. Uh, they use it for uh, VIP recognition, enhanced customer service uh, programs to, to identify uh, those that have opted into those, to those programs. There's also voluntary problem gambler self-exclusion, which is 
was already being done before the technology is available, but this allows a, an easier way for that to be done. And of course, enhance security. In the um, business uh, and retail world, I mentioned earlier the remote online identif identification for um, sellers or workers. We also have uh, the ability to speed check out lines of contactless payment using facial recognition. Also um, in the entertainment industry, the ability to enter, to enter venues quicker, be able to uh, pick up your tickets online and also use your uh, biometric authentication to, to enter facility. Uh, but it's also important to um, preventing ticket fraud. Uh, and then there's also the ability to fight organized retail crime and use the existing loss prevention programs uh, to identify those individuals that are uh, involved in those uh, theft crews. Um, and then also, in, so in the healthcare industry at another area, uh, the touchless aspect of the technology is very, uh, very useful. Um, it's, it's being used in some deployments today to uh, make sure only authorized access to clean rooms and surgery rooms. Uh, so only the right personnel are getting in there, but also they don't have to touch anything uh, when they enter and exit. Uh, it also limits the need for frontline workers to have to swipe badges uh, or use codes to verify their credentials, just an easier, quicker way to do that. Um, and then this, the next area, um, consumer and in-home electronics. This one, I think you're gonna see a lot of growth in. Um, in, in today, already home security systems are, that are integrated with electronic locks are already enabled by facial recognition uh, software to enable the homeowner and their family members to, and other authorized guests to be able to enter um, their, their residence easily. That's something that's already fielded most of the major systems. You've also got uh, smart baby monitors that will uh, provide information um, as they uh, monitor your baby. And then uh, there's also other types of in-home electronic devices that can be customized for specific people that are in the room or the uh, residence at the time. That's something that's definitely gonna be uh, a growing area. And then there's also, uh, and I, this, this is relevant kind of across applications, but the ability to do uh, screening, like real-time screening uh, based on in, enrolled lists, so authorized uh, lists. This could be um, used in stadiums, but also in, in bars and clubs and other types of entertainment venues. Uh, there's also an important security uh, role for that type of system uh, where you have, a, uh, you're, you have a, a screening list for individuals who are prohibited from being a, in, at, a, at a property because um, they've, they have made threats or there's been incidents in the past, which is important for uh, security at a number of different types of venues. So uh, then one emerging area, and this is something that's not widely available yet, but is coming, uh, is providing more accessibility for disabled persons uh, to, to and there's, there's one example where um, uh, people that are suffering from blindness, memory loss, or this condition called face blindness, where you have difficulty recognizing people, uh, this software and, and related devices can be used to help make life easier for those, for those folks. Also, um, uh, to customize heating, lighting, and sound and other kind of room or building features, those individuals that are not able to um, access those building controls very easily. So I think in the future, um, I think where we're, we're going, I, th I think the biggest area of future growth is going to be uh, incorporating facial recognition into digital ID solutions. This is important for uh, both private and public sector applications. Uh, some companies and government um, agencies have already started to develop biometric enabled digital ID. And I think that's uh, one area we're gonna see more, see more growth in. I know we're probably gonna be talking a little bit about um, um, policies and laws and regulations as it relates to this. I'm happy to, um, to answer any questions there, but um, I know that, that uh, you know, there's, there's a number of principles that apply to the use of facial recognition like they would other biometrics and other um, use of personal identifiable information, uh, which we've articulated in our, in our principles, but um, certainly uh, we need to make sure that there's always a legitimate business use purpose for um, collecting this information and using it. And that use is clearly defined and limited. Um, and also data protection. Um, I know that there's a lot of, there is a lot of concern out there about how biometric data is uh, collected, stored, and, um, and even the concern about it being shared. I think there's a lot of things that are being done in the market today that alleviate those, those concerns. Um, but also uh, there should be reasonable notice when, when facial recognition is used in the public space. We're starting to see um, some interest in that. New York City actually passed an ordinance uh, just this last year has just gone into effect recently. Uh, 
requiring that notice to be posted. It's something that our um, member companies are helping their customers with in New York City. And then, of course, in, in any kind of safety and security application that I uh, that I mentioned earlier, needs to be very clear criteria established that governs how those uh, processes work and that would protect the privacy of individuals uh, involved. So most, uh, you know, many states have already included biometrics and facial recognition in some laws addressing uh, personally identifiable information, including data breach laws. Uh, but I think that, that it's going to become uh, pretty important to address as we start down the road of, of having a national data privacy framework. Uh, certainly, as far as um, private sector uses, I think the, the considerations for use of uh, facial recognition technology and related data, it's very similar to other biometrics, needs to be treated uh, in the same way uh, as that data. And I think there's an opportunity to address that nationwide in a, uh, in a national bill. Of course, that path forward is complicated uh, on that legislation. But a number of states have uh, acted to uh, enact consumer data privacy laws, most recently Virginia, and, and certainly facial recognition and biometrics are included uh, in those uh, in, in those those laws and the, what applies to the restrictions that apply to the data. So um, I think you'll you'll find in the review of the different policies out there that that uh, CSIS has just recently published. Uh, there there's quite a quite a few different approaches. I think. You know, one of the things that's cautioned against there, which, which I agree with, um, is, is to make sure that um, in regulatory measures or even in the bans where it's been considered to ban the technology in states and localities, uh, got to make sure that we're not inadvertently banning by, you know, customer app, consumer applications that are, that are very helpful and where there's low privacy risk. Those are getting caught up in many cases in these, in these efforts because they're scoped too broadly. Something was pointed out in the report. I think it's really important. And I think it's clear from a review of how this is being addressed so far, proposed to be addressed in legislation, um, that uh, that's what's going to ha happen with a lot of these proposals. Uh, they're scoped because they're scoped so broadly. So it's definitely a need for better policies that are more targeted to what this, uh, that are application specific, so that the particular concerns that might be raised by a particular application are addressed. Um, and then also policies that are addressed that are formulated with a clear understanding of what the application is intended to, to achieve and how the technology works. Uh, but I'm already seeing signs that policymakers and stakeholders from industry, uh, law enforcement and civil society are beginning to coalesce around uh, many of these principles uh, that, that CSIS has acknowledged in their report and others um, have put together. And I'm really hopeful that uh, we can um, you know, move forward in a way that achieves greater transparency and public trust about how this technology is used and includes the necessary safeguards to make sure that it's not misused somehow. With that, I'll, I'll see if uh, John or James, do you have any questions? No, Jake, let's go ahead and go into the panel. Thank you for that. I was tempted to ask you to take a bet on when you think privacy legislation, federal privacy legislation will actually pass, but I don't think that would be fair. So let me start with a, a sort of basic one. And this one, we can just give a short factual answer. I don't, I don't care who does it, but somebody asked me, what's the difference between facial recognition and facial comparison? Jake or John, this is a, a hot button point for many in the industry. So I, I don't know which of you wants to tackle it. If, I'll do it if you don't, but uh, <laughs> you're the speakers. Go ahead. I can I could jump ahead, in. So, so these are so th these unfortunately these technologies have been confused in uh, some of the media, re media reporting about the study of, of facial recognition accuracy. So um, there's algorithms that do facial recognition, which is photo matching, right? We're we're either matching one to one, we're doing identity verification from an enrolled um, you know identity, or we're searching other enrolled they call templates, which is the uh, digital um, uh, digital file that's produced based on a photo that are compared against other digital files called templates. Uh, you're comparing against another database to see if that identity might be in that database. So it's it's based on matching and potential matches. So the difference is uh, facial comparison technology or face analysis is called different things. Those are actually different algorithms that are built for a different purpose, and that is to um, look at a photo and uh, 
extract certain information or, or likelihood based on that photo. Is it a male or female, you know, uh, approximate age, things like that. These are entirely different purposes and different algorithms. And I think people are, um, you know, have been kind of confused about that. And there's been some studies of older face analysis technology that um, and it wasn't very good, frankly, in, in, in showing a great disparity across demographic groups. Uh, but unfortunately, that's that's been that's several three or four years old now. That's been used now to implicate facial recognition technology, and they're not the same thing. Great, thank you. Let me tackle one uh, what I consider a misconception that Jody raised and others have raised, which is the idea that there's one big pot of federal data where everything resides and it can be searched by uh, any federal agency. And we, we know in real life that's not the case, but I don't know, Jody, if you want to talk about um, how do you store data? Who do you share it with? Uh, John or Jake, if you want to jump in after that, but what are the rules around your data? You talked about disposing of it pretty quickly. So um, keeping in mind that the use case that I was specifically mentioning was the port of entry, um, mm -hmm. verifying the documents of the person um, um, compared to you know, what we have on our files. We're doing that through our matching service, which is pulling from various types of holdings to do that um, comparison of the two photos. Where we have data storage, um, we actually, um, I, I think I would defer to Obam on that, you know, because we work with them and we do capture um, information on certain types of cases for enforcement purposes. We do um, enrollment of non-citizens um, between um, again, 14 and 79, which is kind of in, in line with what we were already capturing um, fingerprint wise. And the storage of that um, goes into the, um, our IDENT system um, and is stored basically, I think for 70 or 75 years or something. Um, you know, and that's normal kind of enforcement kind of things. What we don't do at this point um, on a you know regular basis, again, we're doing this matching to do the identity of the person that's in front of us. Um, we do call it comparison versus recognition, probably to kind of help um, carve out the fact that what we're doing at the ports of entry is not taking this photo and throwing it against every single you know data holding out there to try to see if the person matches. It's all pre-populated by biographic information on um, who we already know is going to be arriving, and it's doing that that quick match um, through the algorithm. Great, John. Did you want to add anything? Yeah, to complement what, what Jody said, that was good. From the open perspective, we, we have dozens of customers. We don't own the data. We, one word is curate the, the data for, for the other customers. So all of the business rules, all of the privacy, civil rights, civil liberties, all those other reviews, which are very lengthy and very in-depth, are all uh, worked out between our office um, uh, CBP, ICE, uh, state, other other users, and then reviewed by policy, legal, privacy, civil rights, civil liberties, and others to ensure that only the people that are authorized can see information, and those th that can't are specifically prevented from having access uh, to that in information. But that, that that's a good question, it, Jim. If I could go back to the previous question, just a little bit of a clarification. Because on facial recognition, it could be a one-to-one. -one. I've got a probe image. I, I, I purport that it's John Boyd, so you compare the two. And, and the identification, which is a one-to-many search, here's a probe of John Boyd, he's in this database, as opposed to characterization. And I think this was in one of the papers from CSIS, which is trying to uh, uh, extract other information about that person as opposed to here's a corporeal being is this does this image belong to the same corporeal being as this as uh, another image in, in the gallery just just a, a bit of a clarification there yeah I think the um, the confusion between uh, recognition and what we're going to call comparison has been one of the handicaps to the discussion because they are very different. Uh, Jody, you talked a lot about use cases. Um, maybe we can broaden it just a little bit. And anyone else, J Jake, this will probably apply to you as well. What can travelers expect in the future? The, the thing that got me excited was not having to wait in line at Dallas Airport. <laughs> um, 
which uh, is attractive. So what should travelers expect? And beyond beyond maybe the airport entry thing, I, I don't know what you want to say. And then Jake, if you want to add anything, but Jody, over to you. Um, yeah, so we are uh, doing current testing right now. Um, this week, there's a newspaper article that actually went out about it. And we are testing the ability to capture um, facial images of on the move in vehicles. Um, this is at a uh, pilot port in Texas. Um, we, you know, want to verify how accurate it is um, at, at identifying this. And again, we do have this mandate that requires us to biometrically confirm all of the travelers, um, you know, all of the non-citizen travelers that are entering the United States. So again, everything that we've done with facial has been a two streamline the ability to do this. You know, we can stop every single person as they come in there, you know, and, and have to run fingerprints on all of them, but it's a process that takes, a, you know, a while to, to execute. And what we found um, as we implemented this in our operations was that it, you know, carved off approximately 40 seconds per for um, all of the non-citizens that we were capturing fingerprints on. If we already had that information in the holdings, we can match it, you know, through their face and it essentially streamlines all of this. Um, you know, as we rolled this out, we also um, found that our trusted traveler kind of kiosks and things where people were voluntarily already um, utilizing this for global entry, you know, to enroll and, and be able to take care of this themselves. It eliminated the need for all of that. And we were able to start incorporating the facial technology into that. So these kiosks that we have that may eventually just be totems, we're testing that. Um, we're testing some e-gate capabilities that would allow that biometric processing for the trusted travelers that are enrolled to be able to um, continue to have even a more streamlined process because everything that's being done right now at our operations is still with a CBP officer there. Um, again, as that backup, if there is no match to be able to, um, I, you know, do the identification to speak to the person, verify intent, you know, so the more that we have these trusted traveler kind of programs that are um, growing, we hope to see um, expanded services that will be able to streamline, you know, how they can get through the borders quicker. And um, I just as a side note, I know it had mentioned, um, Jake had mentioned also that the uh, cruise industry, this is one of the solutions that we actually work directly with industry on um, through cruise reengineering workshops, because in Miami, there was a period, and I think we started this back in 2016 or so, that they realized that the vessels that they were building were essentially double the capacity of the current cruise ships coming in. So we were used to doing processing in this confined operational space to process, you know, say 3,500 passengers that were coming off of these vessels and they doubled and some of them were up to 7,000 passengers with that same terminal size and, you know, being able to streamline and get them off in a manner that was not going to be intrusive was um, just a lot faster. And it took away the uh, CBP officers having to stand there and do this, you know, verification against document to the person with this quick, you know, thing that they can just walk by, do the photo and get through a lot faster. So it's been very exciting for us to see the effects that this has had and industry has been fantastic partners because they see the benefits of it. And they look to incorporate it into their operations even more, um, which, you know, just works even better for us to partner with them. Great. Jake, did you want to add anything to that? I just, well, I, I know that, you know, the travel industry has been very um, uh at the forefront of implementing this technology. And I think that the CBP deserves a lot of credit for identifying that, you know, early on and then integrating their, the government process into, you know, what they were doing and seeing that as a, as a, um, as a need area. So that's great. Okay. Um, can anyone tell us what the role of NIST is in this? I mean, we've had NIST speakers before, so uh, you can contradict them if you want, but how closely do you work with NIST? What's the role that NIST plays in the development of this technology? And that you, with you, either with your agency, Jody, or with uh, the industry, Jake. So, uh, John, you seem to be the most ready to go. So, well, unless, unless Jody wants to talk about it, I, I'll mention we, we have a close partnership uh, with NIST. Uh, um, uh, they evaluate some of the uh, approved images. Uh, from our database and, and compare them and uh, evaluate them against a range of face matching algorithms that are out there to see how well they perform. Um, we're working with them and international bodies in the development of um, uh, this face image quality standard. Because right now, all the, this, the, the quality 
measures are proprietary by algorithm. And we see uh, the, the value in coming up with a quality standard, not unlike what we do for fingerprint, but for a generic face matching system. So it, it's been a, a great working relationship with them and uh, uh, some very uh, capable uh, people systems to be able to evaluate and work with us to uh, uh, move standards and uh, other evaluations and even tuning systems uh, forward. So I think it's they're a huge asset for our country. Uh -oh. Yeah, I'll just add. Uh, I, th I think that their their the NIST um, uh, program, specifically the FRBT, you know, test program, is going to play a larger, even larger role in the future. You know, we hope, and it's something that we've been. Um, talking to folks in Congress about the need to provide them with more resources to expand their testing portfolio, because, you know, as already as it stands right now, this is, you know, no, no method of testing the, the technologies without some kind of limitation, right? But this is the, the, uh, they're the leading um, scientific authority in the world on facial recognition accuracy. Uh, and, you know, that they, they're, they have their way of testing the technologies that is, there's a high level participation across the industry um, in this. They're able to do it in a way uh, that holds kind of all else equal and compares them um, evenly, you know, to each other. Uh, but I do think, and they, they put out an important report uh, two years ago about the, the uh, demographic performance across, you know, performance of the technology against uh, different demographic groups. Uh, and, and that report was, was uh, um, you know, cherry picked uh, by, and by a lot of folks, but, it did show that the leading technologies have really addressed that issue even then uh, two years ago in, in a very uh, uh, thorough way. However, um, there more needs to be done. I mean, that's a really uh, serious concern that a lot of folks have about performance across demographic groups and then what implications that might have uh, for those individuals for whom it may work you know, less well for. And I, I, there's, we, we know from talking, there's more they can do in that area. I think it's just a matter of resources um, to provide that assurance and, and have you know, vendors show the performance of their technology in even a more robust way across demographics. Well, Jody, I got one that's specifically for you. And that was one that we might all be wondering, which is, am I ever just gonna be able to walk onto the airplane? <laughs> I hope the answer is yes, but uh, if it is yes, give us a timeline. I know it will be some years away, but what, what that's, people love that. Uh, the idea that you'll just be able to walk normally and not have to stop at check-in desks and everything. So, so that that's something that um, we really work closely with industry on, and industry is the the lead on that. Um, the the uh, carriers that have implemented um, the ability to do the um, facial matching to board their aircraft have um, found just monumental times. I think we've had some success stories where they boarded, you know, a a 300 plus passenger aircraft in 20 minutes, which is completely like, you know, unheard of in, in some of these cases. Um, it, it's definitely a process that I think people see the benefit of, but it does rely on industry being able to implement that uh, technology and to get the cameras integrated with their systems to board the aircrafts quickly. Um, I think, you know, obviously everybody's been impacted by COVID and, you know, we've been working very closely with our um, travel partners to try to support um, any kind of the efforts that we can. And I know Jake had mentioned, you know, that curb to gate process. This is something that um, we've got various kind of, um, you know, testing and discussions kind of in place to look at that because the more that we can incorporate this as a seamless process, you know, we have the information that we need um, to, to do the verification and it just helps everybody in industry. So I know, um, you know, it's, it's definitely, um, I don't, I'm sorry, I can't offer a specific timeline, but we're definitely working towards that. And that's our vision of, of travel in the future is this seamless process. <laughs> that would be great. Um, can someone, maybe all of you, talk a little bit about how facial recognition technology fits into the larger biometric uh, environment? We've we've talked about iris scans, we've talked about fingerprints. There's some other stuff that we you can do. Um, where does facial recognition fit in? Is it is it a integrated approach to biometrics, or are there still pieces? How does it work? Um, Don, this is your office. Do you want to start? I, I will, Jim. Thanks. 
our office is a, a moving forward with an approach that we should be uh, looking at a, a multimodal biometric collection because uh, there is no one perfect biometric. That there's always some application that may be better tuned to fingerprint versus iris versus face. Uh, but uh, face is a very important one for a lot of the reasons that, that were just said, but it, it's part of a, of a broader portfolio. And if we can take a person, John Boyd, with the face, with the fingerprints, with the iris, depending on when those are available, we can more readily tie that back to the person uh, and to the uh, application, whether, whether it's a screening for a bad actor, or criminal, uh, or for access control to a facility or to a network or even searching uh, for, for that individual. So it, uh, it, it is very much um, uh, improved as a, an accuracy more dramatically than any other modality I've seen in the, in the last decade. And it's, it's soon becoming a, a, a fundamental uh, biometric in, in a portfolio for us. Anyone else, Jake, do you wanna to touch that one? I think I would say something similar in that, um, you know, certainly I, I think, you know, you're right that every, each biometric has its own strengths, you know, and so you're going to see more the applications where facial recognition offers those, those advantages. Um, you know, that's where you're going to see the most, the most growth of it, um, you know, compared to others. But I will say too, I, I know that um, iris technology is also rapidly advancing. There's, there's applications of that that combine the two um, for, primarily for, for authentication, as John uh, mentioned. I'm definitely seeing more interest in that within the industry. Okay, we have time for about one more question and I'm gonna make it, what I hope is not too hard, but I'm gonna ask each of you to answer it. One of the premises of the work that we've been doing that we've heard from everyone we've talked to is um, facial recognition needs to be surrounded by rules, by guardrails that make sure it's used responsibly. If, if those are in place, um, most people are comfortable with it, uh, especially if it's transparent in what the rules are and how it's being used. So um, we have rules. Uh, which one would you, what would you do to strengthen them? Everyone has to pick one. If you got your wish list, what's the one thing? You can do two if you really want. What would you do to strengthen the rules that govern the use of facial, rec rec <laughs> facial recognition technology? Just any one thing. So uh, a lot of attention as the report that we've put out went through a laborious process of looking at all the state, local and federal proposals. Um, a lot of ideas out there, uh, some are good. Um, what would you do? So uh, I don't know who wants to start. Uh, I'll go down the list if we don't, if you, if you want. Um, Jake, why don't we start with you? Sure, so it, you know, the reality is that by far, most of the concerns about facial recognition has centered around um, government use and really specifically use by law enforcement. Um, I, and I think that there is an opportunity here to um, enact measures, you know, maybe federal, but certainly, you know, state, uh, maybe even local level uh, that really, you know, inject the kind of transparency and accountability we need. I mean, there's already we know there's already a lot of mistrust between the police and the communities they serve in a lot of places. I think, unfortunately, this uh, discussion about this technology has kind of gotten sucked into that um, issue, which is really important. But uh, there's things, there's basic things we can do um, for transparency and accountability to we to be sure that law enforcement is using the, the technology effectively and responsibly. Um, and if it's being misused, we're going to find out. Um, and, and also that there's set limitations, you know, that, that for government use of the technology. And I think that I'm, I'm, I know that there is a lot of good ideas out there, even coming from law enforcement community that we'll be seeing um, on how to do that. There's definitely a, a need for it to address those concerns. And, and that's what I would like to see happen. Great. Um, Jody, how about you? This is your big chance that you're... <laughs> Um, it's kind of a tough one for us. I do think that we already operate with a lot of, of guidance. I would say, um, again, I think having the standards, as um, Jake mentioned, um, and ensuring that transparency of how that's used has been um, something that we've been um, successful with, I think, in being able to implement. We, we also get a lot of the um, concerns, you know, from the public on, on our use case um, for 
for facial and and it's one of those things that I think we've had to go go through a lot of hurdles in ensuring that there is full transparency on how we use it. Um, you know, again, down to how we're storing everything, um, to testing everything, and making sure that it's um, you know that the public is comfortable that it's not being misused in any way. Um, but again, we do have that kind of unique use case um, that's different than how traditional law enforcement kind of um, might be tending to use that for investigative purposes. Um, so um, again, I, I, I kind of, um, that's a tough one for me because I, I feel like we, we have a lot of rules in place already. Yeah, it's not really fair to ask someone to ask what more rules do you want, but uh, <laughs> I have to do it. Uh, uh, John, uh, how about you? This is such a, a wide ranging question. If you go from the collection and the, the, the comparison activity and the sharing, I, I, I want to get, talk about the actual processing of the imagery and, and how, we've, how we do the recognition, particularly on the manual side. And, and, I, and I go to this because it keeps popping up in the proposed legislation. And that is the training and certification for the face examiners. And we've been doing our own uh, uh, evaluation of what's the state of play of training? Uh, what is the certification like? And, and uh, as a result of that, we're looking to put some uh, planning on providing uh, research and development in this, in this area, working not just within DHS, with DOJ, DOD, and others to advance that training to make sure that the face examiners, uh, when used, are well-trained and for the, the, the certification to, to make sure that they're uh, uh, meeting the standards uh, for facial recognition. Uh, so that's, I think that's an important one. Great. And when you say uh, the examiners, you mean the machine is going to deliver uh, a result, a percentage, and then someone has to make a judgment. Is that right? Or? Well, for, for many, for, for the one to many searches, you get a candidate list. It could be five, could be 50. And that, but that goes to a human person that has to go back and say, here's the probe. Is it one of these five? And if so, which, which one is it? And th there is uh, opportunity for us to improve uh, across the community uh, in this realm. And, and we're looking to advance that. Great, thank you. Anyone have any final words they wanna say? Because I thought this was really a great panel. Uh, I learned a lot. I actually got a fair amount of notes just myself and it made me feel really good. I'm, I'm looking forward to the day I can just walk onto an airplane and Jake, some of your commercial things, we're already seeing them. So with that, let me thank everyone for sitting in. Uh, thank you to all our speakers and uh, we will have this available on YouTube. Uh, sometime in the next couple of days. So thanks again. Everyone have a good rest of their afternoon. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. Much appreciated. Thank you.